we are, folks, Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock, downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston hosting our show once again, uh, Where the Road Leads. We had a couple weeks off for various administrative reasons and travel reasons and such. Back on again with three of our guests who've been together on the show before, but actually not together on the same show. So I'd like to welcome Greg McConnell, General Wong, and John Mullen in San Francisco. John, how are you? Good, thanks. Hi, Ted. And uh, when these three are together, you never can tell what the subject may end up being or where it may go. But it's going to have um, a lot of systems thinking in it. It's going to have a lot of cyber overtones to it. And with the addition of Greg to the mix, it's going to have an incredible social and human value uh, function in it. So we're here to talk today about cyber, cyber in the Pacific, cyber in Hawaii, and the, the trends and changes we see coming, challenges and such. And uh, General Wong, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you've been very um, aggressive in thinking about the cyber issues and bringing them to the awareness of the people of Hawaii. It's been six months since we've had that discussion. What, what are your thoughts at this point, uh, halfway into the year? Well, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, Aspen uh, Security Forum, which brings in the leaders of the NSA, um, Cyber Command, CIA, I mean, all, all the major leaders in, in, uh, in intelligence and in defense. And it, what, it, what I learned there, it just reinforced what I was thinking is that, you know, the, the operate, the, we have to get to the operations of cyber, where the education piece can put people in, in different companies to do things within their own stovepipe industry or sector. But until you bring them all together into an area where you can bring private data with analysis capability, you don't really understand what is going on. You can defend what's going on, but then you're trying to understand what's going on. So until you get operational, not, not just operational experience, but express these cyber factors in operational terms as they affect your operation is, I think, what you're talking about here. So it's no longer something remote and something uh, idealistic. It's doing something to you at this moment. If, if you take the island of, Ho um, say you take Oahu, it's got 90 percent of the population. It's got our critical infrastructure is very important, but their current in their critical infrastructure rests our banking, our airlines, uh -huh. everything, our everything medical, we depend on. and then PACOM, the major military in the Pacific. They use the same critical infrastructure that we use, so they're a customer to this. So it becomes even more important to national defense that the state of Hawaii secure itself uh, cyber wise. Interesting. And now that, of course, uh, extends to the Western Pacific, where Greg's mind is right now, even though his body is here. Uh, Greg, say a little bit about the concepts you've been thinking of in terms of the effect on the local populations in the Western Pacific Islands of the climatic change and such. That would be informed and would be responded to through cyber means. I, I think the biggest thing is, if you think about cyber as a nerve system which allows all the different pieces to connect, then we're missing an opportunity if we don't connect more closely with the small Pacific Islands. And the reason I say that is the impacts of climate change and the opportunities to test climate adaptation strategies is greatest with those small Pacific Islands because they are the canary in the coal mine. So if we were able to have very good uh, cyber or, you know, just IT connect connectivity. A lot of these places don't have good internet, and if you start going to the smaller atolls or the you know outlying islands, they don't have any kind of connectivity. But if we were able to set in sensors and begin measuring longitudinal changes in sea level rise, in temperature, you know, and looking at vectors and the different types of plants that are now being impacted by the climactic changes, then as a larger island like Hawaii or even Taiwan or Guam or something like that we're getting an advance notice of what is actually happening, maybe 10, 20, 30 years ahead of what we will feel as an impact if we just wait and uh, So cyber right connectivity in this way that you're describing allows the, uh, everybody to be on the same playing field, level the right. playing field and express these issues in a, in a somewhat of a common form. Let's ask John Mullen, who's standing by at Promia in San Francisco, John, that's quite incredible opinions we just got here from General Wong and from, and from Greg in terms of the operational aspects and then Greg expressing it in terms of the effect on, the, on a really significant population. What are your thoughts on the way the 
uh, the networking is coming together and the, net, the risks in that network and this sort of thing that would support uh, what uh, General Wong and Greg are talking about. How's that all moving along? Well, I think first, uh, to address General Wong's comments, we had um, contracts over 25 years for cyber defense, and what we had to do early on was build cyber offense and uh, produce tools and technologies because uh, we believe that no one can understand defense unless they also know offense and, and the same. So uh, we built a number of tools, and now you can take many tools off the internet. Kali is maybe the most no notable, but there's many, many, and, and become knowledgeable. And, uh, and as you say, General, I agree with you, you have to have the operational knowledge. So what, what we try to do in, in the virtual environments, the cloud environments will help us a lot, because you can make a mirror image of your operational environment and you can uh, actually capture live traffic from your operational environment and then replay it in a virtual environment and fire live attacks continuously and observe the results. That's what we've been doing for years. So you, you may not get the most advanced, most cutting edge attacks that come out of the middle of certain places, although you can do pretty well, uh, but you certainly get a complete understanding of the knowledge of the networks and the capabilities, not only of generic network, but of your particular environment, your particular bank, your particular environment. And it's relatively inexpensive in the cloud environment. You don't have to buy all new equipment. You don't have to run a complete separate production, 10,000 machine sort of environment. So I would strongly recommend that. And you see it happening. You see it happening with the kids. You see it happening in certain guys that are really hobby into networks. And I think you'll find in many of your places, especially Alaska and some of the others, that you probably already have a contingent of people that are aware and knowledgeable of doing this. I think probably pulling them together. And then the, just a little bit of an aside, the new major focus is the wireless and wireless mesh, and not just Wi-Fi, but all the different waveforms in, uh, in IEEE and then other non-IEEE environments. And those are a whole different brand of, of uh, cyber and, and both attack and defense. Now, the other gentleman, uh, what I see there is you're looking to uh, use the cyber connections for what we'll call an application in a sense, which is the interconnection of people's knowledge and awareness of physical space going around. And I completely agree with that. That's, that's wonderful. I'm not sure that that's going to be a super target for people to attack. I certainly hope not. So I, hopefully you, you've got a, uh, a stable uh, information sharing uh, thing. It seems that people mainly attack for money or for some sort of terrorist uh, activity, or for a warfare sort of situation, as we've seen in a number of countries. So, you know, that's one of the first things we do when we do threat assessments, is go in and identify your critical assets, and who would want to get to you, and why, and how would they normally get to you, and all of these sort of things. It's a military approach. Um, but I hope that uh, answers the, the issues. So what you're suggesting, John, is that the, uh, the evolving technology can address both the operational uh, expression that uh, General Wong brought forward in terms of taking uh, uh, factors that are important to us, banking, uh, defense and such, and uh, ex express the status, the stability, the threats against them uh, today in terms that, uh, uh, that respect the network uh, threat factors. And at the same time, uh, that kind of system could be used to allow Greg and people who are dealing with the Western Pacific in this case to bring them onto the picture at the same playing field level as everybody else. And it would be, it struck me as you were talk, talking about that, that, and as you were talking, Greg, about having sort of everybody at the same table at the same time and exploring the cause and effect in an in a on ongoing dynamic environment expressed in operational terms, as General Wong's uh, suggesting. Well, part of it is people don't understand the inter interdependence of, uh, of cyber, where um, Everyone's network is connected, and anyone could be the, the, the weaker point in it, especially on an island like this. That's why Hawaii is such a great laboratory, and even as Greg looks at even the smaller islands in the Pacific, because we're not affected by anything except our own system. It's not as if we have a connecting state that, like they're inputting a, a, a virus or a malware. It's Hawaii is Hawaii, and we have a one-up on everything. And understanding who, what, when, and where they're doing that. Now, you know, the banking industry may, may understand certain things are hitting the banking industry, but why, if we go a deeper dive here in the state of Hawaii, if you look at electric, uh, the telecom, banks, transportation, you, if you can do some big data analysis and, and then understand 
who and why they're doing this. Are they trying to get to PACOM? Are they trying to just source different things? I mean, people would want to take, our, take out energy and, and communications because of our military here. So our military, which adds to the economy of the state of Hawaii, adds another risk because um, of its criticality in the Pacific. And then that feeds actually with some thoughts Greg has. We have a workshop next uh, Wednesday on that very subject of taking the developments and evolution of this kind of network thinking as an example that occurs in the military and, and transferring that over to the benefit of the civil population. Uh, just talk a little bit about your workshop next week. Coming oh, up next week if you sure. can. Well, first, um, it's not a new idea. And what happened was, I think it was during President Greenwood, uh, University President Greenwood's tenure, and she had reached out to Admiral Willard, who at the time was the PACOM commander. And what they did was they recognized that there were complementary opportunities for growth and development. And so they established a memorandum of understanding to say, hey, let's see where we can work together. I had a chance to talk with Vice President um, Vasilis Sidamos, who's research and innovation, as well as Dean Crouch and Dean Taylor from SOEST and Engineering. And they said, absolutely, huge opportunities. And what they'd like to do is they'd like to try and see how do they manifest these. Um, I'm, I'm a graduate student right now, so I work at the so you know, you're student level. You're trying to level. drive the university from the inside. Is that well, what you're trying to say? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I, grassroots up. And, okay. and so how do we take what is the next generation's leadership from the bottom and help them sort of visualize or, or bring body to what the leader's vision is? And so this first meeting really is going to be a meet and greet. Uh, I think over the past 20, 30 years, the number of people in the United States who actually understand what the military is and does has shrunk as a percentage of the population. And I think in academia, um, there's probably some misconceptions or maybe, you know, they don't have as clear an idea because their perception was based on Vietnam. And on the other side, I don't know how much the people at PACOM really understand the sort of expertise and the resources at University of Hawaii, whether it's in the Manoa campus or throughout the other campuses in the state. And I think there's enormous potential, but unless you sit around the table like this, how are you going to find out what everyone's got in their pockets? That's, that's, uh, that, that's something that reoccurs every couple of years or cycles of the university or something. We've got to sort of reestablish the connection between the Pacific Command, in this case, and the university where it's all going in a way that encourages and, and uh, brings the students into the game and gives them a, a vision of the future. Uh, something you said a minute ago as you were going through your discussion uh, struck me. And, combining it with what John had said, and if I was younger, I could probably remember what it was, but I've noticed that that doesn't <laughs> the case anymore so much, so. Uh, um, John, uh, your thoughts on how the evolution of cyber development uh, in support of the military can apply to our civil condition here and to the Western Pacific, what are your thoughts on how that might uh, transpire? Well, first, I think it's mainly the rigor of testing. And in the military, you know, the, for, for many, many years, we've been doing exhaustive testing all the time. Uh, so it's uh, that, I think the, the, the process, you know, the SEMP, we use Systems Engineering Management Plan for Development, the, which is a formal methods for process, and then the same for the testing. And, the, uh, and so that, but, but I can also tell you, after working with some of the folks there at University of Hawaii and some down in San Diego, uh, UC San Diego and some, that uh, you, you get some very, very top quality things out of those universities, I tell you. Some of the best in the world, really. So uh, there's a, a whole lot to be gained on both sides. But when we hire younger people into our organization, we have to constantly train them on process and formal methods you know so many people want to immediately start coding and you know not really follow <laughs> the design models etc you know i used to be like that too right <laughs> we all were <laughs> but when you really when you've done enough big projects and you see that that extra overhead of most people call it extra overhead of uh, of extra formal methods actually saves a lot of time and money and gets things done as you expect when a number of people are working together and that's not how you do it in the military you know it's uh, well, a point you made was that exercising, which or, or testing, which sounds like exercises, is is a kind of a way to 
refocus on the issues from time to time, also bring the operational side in, and actually you could bring the human side in, in a very good way. Let's pick that up when we get back from our first break here in about one minute. Aloha, my name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper, we try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, you can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. 4.17 in the afternoon, folks. We're back live with you in downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston, uh, John Mullen at Promia in San Francisco joining us by Skype. General Darrell Wong uh, sitting at the table here in Honolulu, as well as Greg Nakano, and having a, a exciting discussion during the break about some uh, realities of what John was just taking us through, and that is the discipline of testing, which then reaches back to the discipline of exercises in which you create the testing. But that then leads, in my mind, to the connection between all the people who have to be involved in an exercise. So if we take that thought for a moment, and then you add the human component to it, how do we create an exercise for the state of Hawaii? How do we create an exercise for the village of Waimanalo? How do we create an exercise for the, some place in the Western Pacific? How would we construct something like that that would not be burdening, uh, too much burdening on the, on the public, but let them see, as you're saying, General, the operational consequences of something in this cyber world that has, uh, either through malfeasance, through malfunction, bad design, whatever it might be, isn't working right? Well, I think um, my, the, the reason I, I'll speak to that is because, you know, we were involved in helping you, the university create their cyber um, exercise for the last so many years. But it, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of people to create that thing. So you can't just have one a year because um, then it's, it's good to have a lot of different ones. So I was just talking to someone else who, their company has is, is created a, a uh, I don't know how to say it other than, it, it's, it's a very realistic um, cyber type exercise, but it can be solely within your own company. It could be solely within the electric sector, banking sector, other sector. And then that way internally, and it can be just one person, it could be people within your company. And, and it's very robust and it's time, so it puts pressure on you and that there's an avatar in it that can give you answers if you ask for it. So it, it really tests your mettle. So you can have many exercises and then at the end have a major exercise within the state. So, you know, they had a, the, the Coast Guard did a maritime uh, port exercise and then the university did a, you know, across state Hawaii. And even in the last Makani Pahili or Vigilant Card, they had a component of cyber exercise in that. But, I think as, as we go forward, you need to be able to do these mini exercises to, to test yourself. It's kind of like getting muscle memory going in the world of uh, cyber. Is, uh, for example, people who might be entering the Molokai canoe race uh, <laughs> would want to uh, make sure they're under water a lot to get the muscle memory going in that direction. Well, you, I akin it to flying an airplane. You can, you can sit down and, and uh, regurgitate everything in a classroom, but until you jump in a plane, you can take her off and land, but then when you're going to fight with someone, it's a whole different... How do you take all your education, because everyone's mind thinks differently, so how do you, you use all that information and go into a fight? Which is what... I, mean, I don't say cyber is a fight, but how do you uh, defend when the offense is much smarter than you are? So that's a fascinating uh, concept, and, and then extending it to where Greg's going, adding the human component, the human response aspect of a displaced population or something affected by a simulated sea level rise, uh, lack of availability of food or fish or something like that. Uh, 
Uh, John, but, how do we... But look at what cyber's already done to us. Everyone's already uh, fearing of it. I mean, it's... You don't even have to do something almost. You won't almost have to just talk about it and people get afraid of it. So it, it's already, so cyber um, psychology is another huge area. Uh, you know, cyber CSI was created by uh, a well-known lady in cyber psychology. John, talk about that a little bit from the perspective of modeling and simulation or some means in which what both Daryl and Greg are saying could be, could be created. And, and I'm just thinking of it in terms of the annual, or the monthly uh, siren test we run around here. We run the uh, tsunami sirens uh, at 11.45 on the first business day of every month. How would we take that kind of periodic need to get our muscle memory going on cyber, I mean on tsunami, and express that in the world of cyber? Well, okay. First, I think you're exactly right. We have the, the sirens here in San Francisco, too. Um, but as you can go back and look at some disaster recovery testing, and I noted the, the big problem in Japan with the nuclear where the real problem that turned out was the lack of diesel fuel for the backup generators. That was the problem. It wasn't the main security issue. It wasn't even the secondary security issue. It was the tertiary. And so when you go through real testing to do simulations, you have to go all the way. And it's the same sort of thing with, with uh, IT backup, where so many times you back up all the devices but you don't know that really the backup tapes are empty <laughs> because you made a mistake somewhere. You never know it until you try to restore, and at that time you have to have it and you don't have it. So that's why you have to go through, as you say, the muscle memory, uh, all the processes, and really go back and, and actually restore to some other drives and see that it really happened. And the same thing with cyber attacks. That's why we have the, the test environment that I talked about earlier with live attacks, and that's why we also capture live traffic continuously all the time from different production networks on customer sites and then replay them in different worlds and different times and different places so it's that's what I said continuous test now as far as the um, as far as the, the tsunami I think what you're trying to do is get people aware it's more like the FEMA issue now instead of the, the computers and the IT it's getting the populations to understand what would be the result of certain kinds of behavior and that goes more to what the general was saying is uh, simulators, either attack simulators or flight simulators is how they train some pilots, uh, and also uh, some modeling and simulation. And I'm sure uh, University of Hawaii has some things in this area where you could actually uh, adjust certain parameters and then have certain behavior shown that, hey, now we're under a tsunami, now we're this, now we're that. And, and I think on a previous uh, show, Ted, we talked about once the communication lines are down now, what does that do to the food sources across Hawaii? What does it do to the power? What does it do to fuel? And, and, and as the general was saying, the interconnection of the critical infrastructure of the country um, in, in Hawaii is a natural because it is so uh, vulnerable in this area. So, you know, I think uh, connecting them all together is a very good idea. Now, we, we have the CERT uh, operation going on in, in many of the villages around here. We have HARP, which is uh, our, uh, awareness aspect to that. I wonder, you know, those are all basically training based. That is, we do classes and we uh, uh, do exercises and such at a, at a, cont at a contained level. Uh, we haven't done that, I don't think, at a cyber level in terms of getting the population to the point of awareness of what the symptoms are, other than your bank account is empty or you can't make a phone call or something like that. But uh, this is cyber is such a complicated and complex environment. It, I don't have a, a clear picture on how we would get a cyber exercise uh, that could be scalable, uh, starting out small and moving around, but uh, do it like we do the sirens. Have you had, and of course it has to come back to the operational side. It can't be just the esoteric side and the science side. If it isn't expressed oper in operational terms, it, it won't be understood uh, by and large by the population. But I guess, I mean, you kind of uh, explained it well enough so that um, you, you don't need to be at the level that John is, and you don't need to be at any university level. Um, cyber hygiene can take care of 70% of the problems that we have currently with cyber. And a community like Waimanalo, who's done HARP, maybe HARP should have cyber hygiene as part of its education so that... People take care of their computers. Did you think of that term yourself, cyber hygiene? Or no, it it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a term out there. And there's courses on cyber hygiene. So if, say, the state of Hawaii, so my, my thought in working 
with some of the high schools that the high schools, a high school will adopt this and their grade school. They teach it to their kids, they teach it to their parents, and they teach it to their teachers. So here's one community that has cyber hygiene. Say another business adopted. So as everyone begins to, to do cyber hygiene, which is fairly, uh, you don't have to be a, you know, a tech, techie geek on it. It's, it's just something a very more simple than, than most of us can understand. Then you, at least you build the first layer of defense, which is, you know, you're not the easy target. And then you know you start building on, you know, uh, defending SCADA systems. And then you see the other thing that that is being uh, worked on by one of the companies here is they all they all they all be certified so that they can go to your your um, systems and either line it up separately or do certain things or buy other certain things. And you could be certified. Uh, cyber. I mean, there's there's no way you're ever going to be cyber secure. But this is like the risk. tsunami, the tsunami ready community. We can right. have a cyber ready community. Interesting. So resilience is how fast you get back to something, right? It, you're never going to stop anything. It's just a matter of how you get back to normal as soon as you can. So very simple things, you know, uh, within say Waimanao. Why Waimanao would be a great place to start cyber hygiene. Let's talk about that with. Uh, uh, the folks in the in the in the cyber dimension, and see if we can figure out some way to make that part of an exercise. Uh, we have to discover first, and then we can figure out what. But but this is what what strikes me. And please correct me if I'm wrong here. But uh, cyber is sort of doesn't have a dimension, doesn't have a geopotential or a geopolitical dimension. It's everywhere, and Waimanalo is uh, geo uh, politically defined as a, by the highway. So the response and the expression of what's going on would be local, but the, uh, the, the framework that's causing things to happen is anywhere. It could be in Hungary, for that matter, and it's affecting people in Waimanalo. So th this is the, f the first time we've really made a transition from local geography to global effect or, or vice versa, uh, whereas fire or tsunami or food and this sort of thing, they're kind of local and local. But uh, this thing is dramatically local effect, but could be caused anywhere in the cyber environment. Well, so, as Greg said, you know, if there's a people use uh, social media, so a bad actor could actually change the dynamics and send everybody somewhere else because they they spoof everything that's coming. It's it should come out of you know there's everything's happening in the West when it's actually happening in the East. So so you understand what can happen. It can confuse your whole emergency management system just by on social media alone. And, and talking about the Western Pacific, where Greg again is, uh, uh, how this concept of cyber ready means you've got to be, you got to have some means of communication. You've got to have uh, cell phones or some other way to communicate. Uh, do you think we could work in that concept or work that concept into the Western Pacific? in some way as we're speaking of Waimanalo? I hope so. I mean, I, I think really what we're talking about when we're talking about getting everyone linked up through the internet or, you know, linking through cyber is that that allows everyone to have more information about everything. And unless you have that broad understanding of what climate impacts are doing to infrastructure, things like that, ahead of the big curve, then you have to wait until it actually reaches your shore. So the further you can push out your human sensors or your understanding of how it's impacting populations that are isolated or are on the fringe, then you're going to have to wait until it actually hits Waikiki Beach instead of stopping it somewhere in Majuro or out in the Pacific Islands. When we come back from our next break, let's talk, John, a little bit about how we might construct this Waimanao-oriented cyber hygiene exercise, and uh, we've got Frencha Kailamoku, uh, who would be, I'm sure, interested in jumping on this, and uh, others. This is a really interesting uh, idea, and we'll take where Greg's coming from on the Western Pacific and tie them together, and we get back from our next break. ...to uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy on Wednesday. 
And we have Sharon Moriwaki, my co-host and co-chair of the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And we have War Warren Bollmeyer today, a special guest with the Hawaii Renewable Energy Alliance and also a member of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. In fact, he's our Renewable Energy Working Group Chair. So he is. He takes care he is. of all of us. You ought to see him in song and dance, too. <laughs> <laughs> he does the musical part of the show. Uh, Sharon is more serious than that, but not much more not serious. Much more. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what do you think of this show? I mean, is this good? I think this is good. We hope it's good. We hope it attracts a lot more people than, than our forum so that people can see what's going on in energy and clean energy and uh, and and call in, write in, tweet yeah, we or want Twitter. That. We tweet. want uh, we want public engagement, civic engagement, from everybody, because that's the only way we're going to get down the road on this, right, Warren? Yeah, I think so. And it's an opportunity for guys um, like me to share a little bit of their mana and and uh, sometimes get the facts right. Who was that guy that said, "Just give me the facts"? You know, start with the facts and then work from there. Oh, it was Dragnet guy, right? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jack that was I was just, a, I was just I in grade school then. I barely that. remember that. Just the facts, man. Just a man, man. <laughs> Here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, <laughs> every Wednesday from 4 to 5. You'll see. Come back soon. Right, Sharon? Great. Right. Uh Yes. <laughs> it's 4.30 in downtown Honolulu, folks. That means we're heading into the last uh, segment of our show, Where the Road Leads, here. Ted Ralston, your host. At Think Tech Hawaii, our guests, uh, General Darrell Wong, Greg Nakano in the studio in Honolulu, and uh, John Mullen, Promia in uh, San Francisco. We are having, once again, a, quite an interesting discussion at the break here about how we would take this hypothetical case of constructing a village of 2,000, village of maybe 10,000, let's just say 10,000 to be on the safe side, a village-oriented cyber hygiene exercise for awareness and for uh, determining uh, directions of, of improvement to make Waimanalo, we'll say, cyber ready alongside its earthquake ready and, and tsunami ready status that it has. That is an incredible thought, sir, and I thank you very much for that thought, because I live in Waimanalo, so that's well, important. But, listen, um, I didn't mention Waimanalo because of you, but Waimanalo <laughs> has been a, uh, you know, one of the leading communities in, in the HARP program. So we'll have to figure out who to how, to how to take that on. But how would we actually construct that? I can, you know, the tsunami thing. I understand that. That's uh, that's, that's uh, geo hydro, I guess, or something in that dimension. The uh, the earthquake readiness is also understandable in a in a physical sense. The cyber aspect is difficult to even wrap your arms around. Let alone create an exercise for. Well, maybe not create exercise, but at least the education piece. So. Whatever elementary schools, whatever schools you have in Waimanalo, your community, uh, you know, Waimanalo community, and the leaders in your HARP program can bring everyone together. So. Now, that's a good point. And HARP and CERT both have sort of uh, sanctioned training programs that we go through uh, periodically. So we'd have to come up with a place where we can get a sanctioned or validated uh, cyber, uh, cyber hygiene uh, program and push that forward. John, have you got any ideas where you might find something like that? Sure, but first one quick question. For your earthquake and your tsunami, are these uh, events that you do regularly to kind of raise awareness? Or, or, or is it a training facility people can go to and, and learn on demand? Or is it, uh, uh, how, are, how is the current ones, how are they currently embodied? It, generally, it's periodic, like monthly uh, meetings of a group of people who uh, get a certain training in that month, and then that training uh, recurs a year later or at some interval. So we have, uh, we just did uh, the uh, earthquake training once again, and it what's, I go through those training. I tell you, when you go through them the second or third time, you see things you never saw the first time. It is incredible that our muscle memory really isn't there, even though we've been through the training. I mean, it takes a lot of pounding this into your head to really get it right. So that's what we do, John, periodic training using a a protocol or a, a training system that's come through FEMA or uh, NOAA or some organization like that. Well, NIST, NIST has a number of things, the cybersecurity framework and the risk management framework that are, and, and DHS has got some, and, and as you pointed out earlier, uh, NSA and DOD have some. Um, but I think, you know, the difference of cyber is when it's an earthquake, everyone knows there's an earthquake. If there's a tsunami, you know it after the fact. You may not know it in time, but, but you, you see the 
the physical uh, things going on, right? In the cyber, you may not know it until after it's all done or, or until the effects are felt, like your, your car doesn't work, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. So you, in that exercise, you have to have early indications and warnings is what we used to call them, where you have, uh, it's like the, the canary in the, in the mine, as you said earlier, where you can see things that are constantly in place uh, identifying uh, changes in behavior, maybe anomaly things, performance-related uh, high spikes of certain traffic, or things that kind of warn you, and like you do with an early warning on earthquake, or like you do with a uh, early warning on, on tsunamis as well. So part of that is, is part of it, but those are things you have to have in place in your organization or in your community. They're not very expensive, and, and I'm sure your universities have those. And then from then on, I think the modeling simulation tools, again, your universities, I'm sure, have some of them, and you can buy some of them, would uh, would be able to, uh, and the, the tool that the general called out earlier, being able to uh, come in and, and have something that can say, hey, let's, let's uh, make a worm attack or a botnet, or let's make it across this or across that. That sort of tool is, is what you could use, and you could do it in, in monthly meetings. And you know, now this meeting, you don't even tell them what they're gonna get, Here's some early indications and warnings, and now here's the results rolling out. And, and just like you do now in the earthquake or the tsunami, you can get some awareness. So I, I think the, it can be done with the existing tools that are there for not much money. That's pretty incredible. And I, again, yeah. as I mentioned, I have to go through recurrent training a lot in order to get the picture. And I have to, I have to play this YouTube <laughs> section back 18 times to hear what John said to understand how to convert that into what we, how we take the next step. Uh, that's a lot of information, John, and I think what you brought up is a really interesting thing. The indi indications and warning for a tsunami is the siren going off because NOAA told us to run the siren. Uh, because, and NOAA looked at the earthquake sensors and they did some calculations. Here, that, that same uh, track record has to be put together. What's the indication and warning at the global level, at the national level, at the local level that a, a cyber issue is, take, is, is beginning to happen? And how do we notify or alert on that? Well, InfraGuard is doing that right now, and there's InfraGuard Hawaii. He's been on your show before, and, and so is the Electronic Crimes Task Force uh, that, that comes out of the Secret Service. And, you know, we're members of both of those, and they're regionally across the country in all sorts of places, and they, they put out daily warnings, et cetera, to members. And so that's part of it. And then you could have some local, too, in your community, some local tools that show things that uh, work together. So I didn't mean to jump in there, but there's already stuff... Uh, in place that's being worked right now from FBI, from Secret Service, from others. It just so happens, if I can interject, we had a, a briefing on UAVs to the InfoGuard uh, two weeks ago, and we, we made the connections there on a UAV basis, but uh, I think we can use those connections and follow up that line of reasoning that John's thinking of here and bring this into the CERT and HARP framework. Well, because as John put out, there's a myriad of things. I mean, depending how sophisticated community is or isn't, it depends on what list of things you can get, but it's just understanding all the things that are out there. So, I mean, John had listed uh, a lot of different ones, but how many people know all these? That's, yeah, so right. That, that, is a, that is an important thing. So we'd have to start slowly and, 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 and keep this, uh, uh, not do it all at once, it's just almost like too much to do all at once, and break it down into elements, maybe start with the indications and warning, and start with that. And move well, on from there. Just think if, say, say a larger community de develop microgrid, say we do come off of the, the grid and everyone has got photovoltaic thing. I mean, they, they could be inputting things into the grid um, because of that. So, I mean, you're heading off a lot of different things that could happen by educating people more on uh, cyber. But it's got to get back down to the community. We can talk in these terms, but then the community people would just sit back and say, oh, let those guys talk about it, right, Greg? <laughs> so, Greg, how would we how would we think about this in the context of one of the uh, the Pacific Islands? I, I I wonder if we have an info guard operation going on there, for example, that would be aware of uh, global threats that are that are potentially accessible locally. That's a really interesting question. I I don't know because I you know still haven't been had the chance to go down, but I think. If you talk about why Manalo, you talk about building a discrete laboratory, a cybersecurity laboratory, cyber hygiene laboratory. I mean, potentially you could have a completely safe and secure environment to do pretty first-rate testing because it would be 
a contained environment. So if you wanted to do the most advanced kind of attacks and, and things like that, you could do it because it'd be a closed system. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. You were talking about a cyber range. So exactly. Yeah. But it's costly to build a cyber range, but I think the way it is now with the cloud and some other things, you know, you could leverage other, you know, you could, you could leverage other ranges that already been built and say we opened our own company and we wanted to test our own metal, whether we can defend against our sector. That, ra that range could put in things that we need to be aware of and they could red team us and we could really see whether we can do it, what we say we can do. But it's not, not so much to, to find fault, it's to just say, how do you harden yourself even more? How do we have to go back to educate ourselves even more? And then how do we change the education system to continue to morph as, as the tax seem to morph? And this comes back to the education system over and over again, doesn't it? So we really have an obligation at, at the end of the day to generate content for the school systems and have them becoming aware of these uh, new developments that none of us ever had to worry about when we were kids growing up. I just had another thought. Uh, get ready, Manoa is about ready to happen again, isn't it? Right. When is that going to happen? I think it, we're shooting for September of next year, 2016. Okay. Uh, did it not happen this year? No. And so um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the, um, and we're lucky because we have Representative Isaac Choi, so he's been very proactive. We actually have legislative support, but what we're trying to do is really build this up in a multi-tier uh, relationship where you actually have the full range from the grassroots all the way back up to the state legislature and then bringing in all the businesses so that... So Oh, you just, you, and I bet you know somebody who's very close to Get Ready Manoa. <laughs> <laughs> right, like your mom. Right. right. Okay. It was been on the show. What if we did that? What if we get a year, and with John's help, thinking through uh, and standing this up now and having an exercise during Get Ready Manoa? And let's tie together why Manalo as a small element, Manoa as a, a larger element, and use those as two uh, ends of the curve here to understand what what we need to do. I think uh, it would be a good example of how we could do this. And Manoa happens to be where the university is, which is interesting. And a lot of very high-level private schools. Yeah. So right. you have two Point. really different communities. Yeah. Well, needing the, the same great things. exercise to yeah. compare the two, and then that also embraces from the west to the western Pacific. It's all we kind of covered yeah, that you range have two as well. Different different types of communities, very John, diverse. For, for John's benefit, what we have out here in, in the various communities as part of their readiness uh, protocols is these periodic uh, get ready Manoa, get ready Eva Beach, get ready Waimanoa uh, uh, exercises or, or opportunities for the public to contact all the agencies and, um, uh, and, the, and, and the training programs and such uh, and the companies even that make products that go forward here to fire departments, police departments and such. Some people have even showed up with UAVs and flown them at these things from time to time. So that, that gathering is generally a, almost like a trade show. Here's what we've got and then there's uh, exercises for kids and such. But that's what we're talking about. Take that structure which exists and add to it this cyber piece. And we have Waimanalo, which Margie and I represent, and Manoa, which Greg represents. And uh, we have a year to do it. Both of them are about a year away. Uh, will, you, will you take that on with us, John? Help us define what a cyber exercise might look like that we can drop in on those uh, get ready, name your town uh, exercises. Sure. What's usually very helpful is if we can identify one that's already happened in your organization, your place, and then redo that one and, and actually show it and, and actually cause it and show how it happens in, in a simulated way. But uh, so then it resonates a little better if it's something that's already occurred. Okay, that goes back to what Daryl's been saying. If it's not operational in your terms, it doesn't, it's not relevant. So we need it relevant and also accurate and uh, interactive in some way. Right. Yeah, we could show it actually occurring. I mean, yeah. on the screens, yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. And you could, you could tie it to the power grid. You could tie it to uh, water management. You could tie it to health. There's, there's many, there's not, not anything that doesn't tie to it since it's all tied to cyber. Wow, that's quite an exercise in, uh, in, in mental... Uh, Especially uh, on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Hey, so, John, you helped us. <laughs> yeah, John, this is, this is as usual, as expected, uh, totally fantastic. Let me ask our three guests, uh, we always ask them to 
pass something to the audience that they'd like the audience to take away as their permanent memory of this uh, show. John, let's starting with you. What would you say in a brief form to the folks watching this? Oh, I think, uh, again, Hawaii is a, a very good place to be doing this sort of uh, testing because you have a community feeling there that's really unlike many other places. And I think it's partly because of the different islands, but it's also cultural, it's historical. And so it's a perfect place. And, and, uh, and it's a combination of the techie nerds, but also getting the human uh, folks that maybe aren't that technical aware and involved. So I think that's a, it's a great opportunity. And then it can be replicated other places, but maybe never quite as, uh, as focused because of the characteristics you have there. Okay, and we can count on you to help us uh, form this up. Daryl? I'll get it real personal to everyone. You know, we're an island. Everyone on this island has a role in safety and security. So you need to find out what your role in cybersecurity in the state of Hawaii is. Okay. And Greg? Well, I, I learned a new word today, cyber hygiene, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give you credit for it anyway, Daryl. So, right. and, and I really think that that's what we're talking about is now, as we have the Internet, everyone is more and more connected with each other. And we have to take care of each other. Whether it's cyber war or cyber peace, we make the choice. Okay, well, thank you very much to our, our three guests, uh, John Mullen, Daryl Wong, Greg Nakano. And uh, folks, have a nice uh, weekend, and we'll see you back next Friday.